Hey then. Hi, Julie. Hi, Kareen. Hi, hi, Maureen. Hello, everybody. All right. So uh, we, we are now back live on YouTube. We're now back live on Facebook. <laughs> I want to sorry about the internet issue. I don't quite understand what happened. But internet went down and now I've been able to reboot everything and get everything back up and running. So hello, life in 2018 and technology. So let's just give it a minute to for every, people to join again. And in the meantime, if you have a question, please feel free to ask that question. Um, and we were in the middle of talking about the IC coffee challenge. All right. So to reiterate, can you drink coffee when you have IC? The answer is number one, it depends on your subtype. And we want you to go, want you to go through a process. We want you to go through a logical process before you drink the coffee. Okay. So, so if you're, if you've got a hundred lesions, I don't want you drinking any coffee at all. If you've got active bladder wall symptoms from IC subtype two, we have to wait until your symptoms are better. If you've got IC subtype three, pelvic floor, IC subtype four, pudendal neuralgia, the odds are coffee is probably going to be okay for you, which would explain why there are so many patients in support groups who say, but I can drink coffee. Okay. That's why, because you're a different subtype. And of course, IC subtype five, central sensitization involves sensitive nerves. So for people in IC subtype five, we gotta be very careful about caffeine. Alexis, hold that thought because I'm going to talk about chocolate in a moment, hot chocolate, okay? So, so number one, it's your subtype. Number two, it depends upon how you feel. So what I suggest people do as you're pondering coffee is I want you to do the, the, the coffee challenge. So you start first with water and water and chamomile tea. If you can drink water and chamomile tea, then you try peppermint tea. A lot of people can't do peppermint because they got GERD. So and so that's why I usually don't mention, mention it. But peppermint tea might be helpful too. If you're okay with those, your next step is to do a brown rubose tea. And this is the brown rubose tea. Okay. If you do okay with this, and of course, start with a diluted form of the tea first before you go to a really strong one. If you do okay with this, your next step is gonna be the herbal coffees, Ticino, Caffrey Roma, Pero are the herbal coffees. A lot of people get, are kind of disappointed with those. They're kind of an acquired taste. I find them to be quite bitter, but that it's we're really about testing what your bladder can tolerate. So if your bladder is doing okay with herbal coffees for a week or two, then you can try the real coffees. But I need you to do a low acid decaf coffee. And there are two that I that I think are good options. Option one is Tyler's decaf coffee. Tyler's has been around for a long time. Uh, I know Tyler, he, his father helped him start the, his company and, and he's, a, he's a lovely man, a young man who is uh, trying to help a lot of people. And so Tyler's is viable um, and they also make a K-cup. If you have K-cups, these are, these are available in the IC Network store. But I, I think the coffee that I would actually put first for you, for those of you who are trying to drink coffee for the first time, is Bella Rosa decaf coffee. And this is what we were talking about when our stream went out. So what's so cool about Bella Rosa is that they, they accidentally made the perfect coffee for somebody who is acid intolerant. So it was, it was, it was actually made here in my county and the engineer who started the company created their own custom roasting process. And it's an air popping, an air popping roasting process. When you heat coffee beans in big metal drums, as most of the big coffee companies do, that hot metal bean contact produces a lot of acid. So it's all about the air popping. If you have an air pop bean, it's going to have quality, quantitatively less acid. And so here at the Bella Rosa Coffee Company, they, they created this and they launched a very diverse line and they were stunned by the number of people who said, I have never been able to drink coffee without pain until you. Why? 
What is it about your coffee that makes it so that I can drink it and it doesn't hurt my body? And they didn't know. They did not know. And so what they did is they sent their coffee to UC Davis to a coffee expert and had him study the coffee and see if he could tell them and explain why this coffee doesn't bother a lot of people. And it came right down to a specific type of acid. There's one acid that is the most known for causing stomach and bladder irritation. And that's what I was pulling up when the computer crashed. I don't want to pull it up right now. And I don't remember the exact name of the acid, but there's one. Oh, God, it's just right on the tip of my tongue, the name of this acid. I'm a chemist, for God's sake. I should know this. Uh, but anyway, so this coffee expert at UC Davis studied this coffee. And what they found is that it had the lowest level of this one specific acid of any coffee produced basically on the planet. Other coffees might have five, like a, a rating of 5%, and theirs was like 0.005% with respect to this one specifically irritating acid. And so this is the coffee I really think you should try when you're ready to try coffee again, because scientifically, this has the least amount of the, the worst acid out there. I mean, coffee acidity is determined by a couple of different things. It's determined by uh, the, the um, altitude that the coffee is grown. The lower the altitude, the less acid. It's determined by the roasting method. So we got to use the air popping, the hot air rather than the metal. And then it's also determined by your brewing method. A cold brew rather than a hot brew extracts less acid out of the bean and less acid into your cup whereas a hot brew pulls more acid. So if you really want to do a coffee, you would do this coffee in a cold brew method, and you can research cold brew. Um, and we used to have a lot of samples of these, but they're, they're something happened with their sampling machine, so they can't do it. But anyway, Bella Rosa decaf coffee would be the one I think you should try. And then again, if you're not, I see subtype five, you, you can even start exploring a little bit of caffeine, a little, a little, wee, 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 little bit. Um, they, Bella Rosa makes a half calf. And again, if you've got this diluted with, you know, milk or whatever, I don't, I, I can't even cogitate drinking caffeine myself. I don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. But again, if you're, I see subtype three, subtype four, you know, your bladder's healed. You might be able to get away with this. You might be able to get away with this, but it's all about listening to your body. And the minute you have any problems, you back off. Now there is one other company that is very, very good. And that is called Simpatico Low Acid Coffee. Um, and, and this has been around for years. A lot of IC patients have drunk this pretty successfully. But again, I think the Bella Rosa is the one that I would start with if I were you, if you were considering coffee and they have a regular and they have, they have a decaf also. Um, but then Alexis asked about hot chocolate. And of course, we know that uh, milk chocolate uh, can contain caffeine, but tends to have a lot of extraneous chemicals in it that can be irritating. And as much as you love that hot chocolate on a cold winter's day, you know, it, it, for me, it would give me bowel spasms. I can't do it anyway. However, did you know that they make white hot chocolate? Yeah. Look at that. Stevens white hot chocolate. And this is what you can do instead of brown hot chocolate when you've got IC or IBS. This should not be anywhere near as irritating as a regular chocolate. Um, and we have little samples that you can buy in our store for like 99 cents. Uh, so we got little sample envelopes. Um, this white, hot, so not only do they have a gourmet white hot chocolate, but they also have a gourmet white hot chocolate pumpkin spice. 
And so this winter or, you know, for Christmas or whatever, this would be a great gift for an IC patient. You know, if you're, if you're missing your hot chocolate, or you're missing something hot to drink. Okay. So to summarize, it's all about the coffee challenge. Any symptoms, don't do anything. You start with chamomile tea and peppermint tea. Then you go to a brown rubus tea. Then you go to an herbal coffee. And then you go to a low acid decaf coffee and work your way up. But you can, the white hot chocolate is universal. That's fine for everyone. So um, I would like to give this away. So I'm going to pick a number between one and 100. I have written it down on a post-it, a number between one and 100. Whoever gets closest to that number in the next couple of minutes will get a free white hot chocolate. So go ahead and vote right now, Lisa. You are, and feel free, feel free to vote again, people. Uh, Rain asks, "What about decaf green tea? All green teas are off the table. Green tea is what? Green tea is way too acidic. You should not be doing any green tea." Why is Brita a no-no for IC? Uh, because it's too good. The problem with a Brita filter is it's an, it's an incredible water filter. It takes out all the minerals. And it's the minerals that give you the pH balance. So when you drink water out of a Brita, uh, out of a Brita filter, you're actually drinking acidic water. It's more acidic than normal. You could prove it yourself if you got some pH test strips and test your tap water and test the water after... Um, uh, it goes through the Brita and you will find that the Brita actually produces acid water. Are there safe holiday drinks? And, and uh, I had um, hot apple cider uh, yesterday. Uh, I dilute it a lot with water and I use a little bit of cinnamon and then I use uh, anise. It's wonderful. Uh, Liz asks, is I see a progressive disease? And the answer is no. Do symptoms get worse? No, not usually. Uh, in fact, patients usually hit their worst in the first, six, the first six months and then they improve as when they start trying treatments, doing the diet, all that sort of stuff. Laura says uh, she's got hip, uh, pelvic pain, uh, she did flexoril, it, it, pelvic pain, it, uh, it didn't make her tired, didn't help her pelvic pain, she has lower back pain. She goes to your hip and butt. Can can this cause a pain? Can that be caused by your pelvic floor? Uh, yeah, it can be. And you need a physical therapist to look at your body, my dear. All right. I see one person is one number off. Another person is one number off. I'm going through the, <laughs> Liz says 92 and three quarters. That's so funny. All right, I'm gonna stop the numbers and I'm gonna go with the person who was the closest to it at the beginning. And that, the number that I picked was 47. So Cheryl Furrer, uh, you uh, did 46. And so, Cheryl, if you can send me um, uh, your mailing information to icnetwork at mac.com, or if you're my Facebook friend, you can send it to me Facebook. But I need you to send me your mailing info. All right, hon? And I'm going to write this down. I'm going to write your name down. Uh, hot chocolate. Okay. How about another giveaway? You guys want another giveaway? I like doing giveaways. Let's do another giveaway. Oh, ho! 
Gave, gave, gave away five of these during our Wednesday support group meeting. All right, here you go. Let's, I'm going to write down another number. Again, so we're stopping all that previous voting. I'm going to go to the bottom here. <laughs> Sonia, she's driving and picking acorns for squirrels, but listening. Awesome. All right. So, all right, guys, I got one of these. Pick a number between one and 100. And the person who gets the closest, we give you 30 seconds to a minute to do it. A number between 1 and 100. Feel free to feel free to vote multiple times. I got no problem with that at all. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right, Jessica Courier. Jessica Courier. Eight. So unless I screwed up and there was somebody else who said eight, Jessica Courier gets the book. All right. So Jessica, if you can send your mailing info to... IC network at mac.com. IC network at mac.com. I will say I've got five. I've got uh, the books from Wednesday. Everything's going to go out on Monday. So we'll do that. All right, guys, let's go back to your questions. Lisa has the book, read it in one night. It's good, isn't it? You guys, if you didn't win the book, the book is for sale over on our store right now. Uh, and you can go buy it over on the IC Network. And when you buy it, you support this chat. And it's very, very appreciated because, frankly, we need the support. And a lot of the funding for IC patient groups disappeared. Uh, there's very little funding now for us. So we re really rely on people purchasing stuff from us and, and members. All right. So... We've been at this for about an hour and a half. I have a Christmas tree to put up, but I would like to uh, spend at least another 20, 30 minutes taking your questions if you would like to. So any other questions? Hit me. Hit me, hit me, hit me. Hit me with your best shot. Yeah. It's so hard because we because we lost uh, we had to reboot. I had to reboot, so I, I I don't have all the questions you asked earlier to go back to. I'm sorry. I'm very very sorry. Are all water filters bad? Uh, you know, Kim. Uh, no, not necessarily. But really, the best water is spring water because spring water has natural minerals in it, and our body relies on those minerals to be healthy. Um, and so, you know, for many people, if you've got good tap water, you're gold. If your tap water sucks, like if, if, if it was in Southern California, then I would be buying bottled water, like Arrowhead water, Crystal Geyser water. I wouldn't be buying Dasani. I would be buying spring water. Don't buy like the Costco water or the Dasani where it's literally water from a big city. Try to get natural spring water if you can. Okay. Karen asks, what are RIMSO installations for? Should they burn bad? So uh, RIMSO 50 is the brand name for uh, the uh, for DMSO, dimethyl, dimethyl sulfoxide. Um, it's a very, very interesting story. So um, back in the 19, late 1950s, they were looking for a way 
to transport kidneys for transplant. So um, if you freeze a kidney, you get ice crystals that destroy the tissue. And so the medical community back then was looking for a way to move a kidney from one hospital to another without damaging it. And somehow they found DMSO. And DMSO is a byproduct of the paper industry. Um, and um, so, they, so the guy who made that discovery kind of got very excited. And again, this was in the late 50s, early 60s. They started thinking of DMSO as a wonder drug that would cure a lot of medical conditions. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, it failed every single study with the exception of the IC study. So what they thought was a wonder drug ended up not being a wonder drug at all. And even we have some doubts about those early studies. I actually interviewed the guy who invented it. I have that lecture on our website and he was, they were, they were putting it in the bladder. They were giving it by EIV. They were doing it orally. And he in fact ended up in also inventing MSM which is the oral variation of it. Um, when you put DMSO in the human bladder, there are many mechanisms of action, and many, and many of which they have not even defined yet. So what we know about DMSO is that it is a penetrant. It will go right through skin, deep in the tissue. So that's appealing because that would help carry medicine deep into the tissue. So if you have a DMSO cocktail with a steroid in it and stuff like that, we know, we know that the steroid can pass deeper and, and potentially help more. Um, DMSO I think is believed to trigger a massive mast cell release. So it helps, re I, 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 there are many, many different potential methods of action. They were not well defined in the FDA approval. And if you looked at that FDA approval study, it would never pass muster today. At least I don't believe that it would. Um, and, and there was a, um, and, and, and it, but it did receive FDA approval for IC. And it, it is in fact the only bladder installation approved by the US government for interstitial cystitis. I indeed had six or eight treatments myself back in 1993. They did nothing for me. and. What my personal experience with DMSO was that it was quite painful to hold it in my bladder. A lot of doctors had really mixed messages. Some doctors told patients to hold it 20 minutes. Other doctors told patients to hold it for two hours. What I knew for me is that the longer I held it, the worse it got. And I made the critical, critical mistake of trying to drive home with it in my bladder. And my drive, the drive was a 20 minute drive. Holy moly, was that a terrible mistake. So whenever you have an instill, we call it dwell time. The dwell time for IC treatment is usually 20 to 25 minutes. Then you pee it out. Then you get in your car and you go home. So, But the question is, why does it hurt? And, and I don't think we have a, a good explanation for why, um, except uh, researchers, there are two female researchers I think they were at Indi Indiana University. Uh, one was, her name was C. Suba Packer. She decided to try to understand the mechanism of action of DMSO in, in animal studies, specifically rabbits. And what she found is that, is that dosage mattered, that the more you increase the dose of DMSO, the more muscle spasmed. And when you got to 50%, which was the FDA approved concentration, it be, in some people, in some animals, it became irreversible. And so it was a dosage issue that the muscle spasms started at a 30% concentration. And then the higher it went, the worse they got. So she brought that research and it got it, to the American Urology Association to a conference 
it's on our website, 1996, 1997, somewhere in there. I, I, that was my first medical conference that I went to as an IC representative. And I introduced myself, learned about it. It was deeply concerning because you talk to a lot of patients who have done DMSO and they have really bad memories of it. It hurt. I hurt me. I, so I, I it hurt. So the question is why she believed that it, it, that it was because it was causing these really violent bladder spasms, these muscle spasms. So then I went around the room and talked with every IC expert. We're talking Lowell Parsons, Chris Payne, Rob Moldwin, whoever was there, um, um, uh, Ray Rackley. It was the creme de la creme of IC researchers because that was where IC research was first discussed. And I asked every single one of them, what do you, what do you think of her study? Do you think that this is valid? And pretty much every single one of them said, yeah, this is important. We need to know this. Um, and a couple of them were like, well, it's a rabbit bladder. It doesn't, you know, it's, we, we don't really know what it's doing to a human bladder, but you know, they were kind of qualifying it that way. So then she was given the opportunity to speak to this group of IC experts, like 40, 50 people in the room, the top IC researchers in the world. And, and she presented her data. It's like a big giant science fair. It's exactly what it looks like. If you've ever been to a kid's science fair, well, a medical conference poster session, that's what it looks like. And they proceeded to have a discussion about it. And the pivotal moment that I will never forget was when Ray Rackley, who was a director of urology for the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, stood up and said, we will never use DMSO again in our clinic. It is, we are done with it. Why? Because they believed that it was causing bladder damage at the 50%, so much to the point that some patients had to have their bladder removed. Okay, that was straight from the director of, of a big urology clinic. So the consensus among these IC experts is that DMSO should never be used at the 50% dose, even though it's FDA approved. Their consensus was that DMSO should be used in a cocktail form with other medicine added to it that would dilute it to about 25%. And that became the operating consensus for the IC world at that point. Now, the next year or the year after, she came back with yet another research study that reinforced her first data, that DMSO actually was harmful to bladder muscle when used at the 50% dose. So, um, and what was so interesting um, I would go back to Amer AUA and go to their IC class, which is the doctors around the world. That's where they get trained in IC. So I'd go into the class too. And I was at one class in particular that was taught by Deborah Erickson, University of Kentucky, Chris Payne, Stanford, and one of the doctor. And they, they recommended DMSO at the 50% dose. And I was baffled by it. I was absolutely baffled by it. And so I was one of the first to the at, to go to the podium after they were done and ask my question. And I said, I'm stunned that you're recommending it at 50% when you were in the room when C. Suva Packer proved that the 50% dose was damaging to muscle. And, and they immediately backed off and said, you're right, you're right, you're right. They said, unfortunately we are only allowed to talk about, we're only allowed to use the information that has major medical studies behind it, whereas her study is a very small study and technically we're not really supposed to talk about it. But they said, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. And yes, we really only recommend doing it at a DM in a cocktail form at 25%. So you try being a patient, not an MD, challenging the best doctors in the world at these conferences, I'll tell you, <laughs> I shake in my boots sometimes, but I'm happy to do it. You know, somebody's got to do it. I was at a conference, another conference where I had a doctor 
uh, Dr. George, uh, what was his last name? Uh, and he was the only doctor studying children in IC. And he had the balls to say to the entire audience, children couldn't feel bladder pain. And I had just worked with two sisters who were in elementary school who, didn't, who couldn't go to school because they had IC pain. And I jumped up. I was furious and said to, said to him, how can you say that? Children absolutely feel the same pain that humans feel. They just can't express it. And he tried to talk me down. But Lowell Parsons was standing right behind me. And he walked up to the, mo to the microphone. And he said, Jill is absolutely right. Children absolutely feel pain. We cannot let this continue. We have to, we have to be compassionate towards children with symptoms. So, you know, when you're a support group leader, you're not just working with patients, you're working with, with care providers. And, and it's our job to keep, keep them on their toes and talk to them and challenge them. And you might be shaken, but, you know, sometimes you got to do it. All right. I'm very proud of the, that moment. Uh, Liz says, sex doesn't irritate my bladder, but it irritates my urethra. Is that normal for IC? No, that's normal for uh, a sensitive urethra. And we talked about that in the, in the first half of this meeting. I would suspect that you probably have some dryness in your urethra that is making your urethra more, ir more sensitive, or you're having a reaction, reaction to a spermicide, or you're having a reaction to the condom, if you're using a condom. The urethra is remarkably sensitive to chemicals. Irene asked about yerba mate tea. It's not one that we recommend, but I have no personal experience with it. That comes from other IC experts who have told me that. Sonia asked, do I need, um, uh, um, do I need another rescue since I've been having flare-ups or is there an over-counter good med? Well, uh, Sonia, yeah, again, it depends upon your subtype. If you're IC subtype 2 bladder wall, then a rescue makes sense. But of course, you would always start with the non-invasive stuff first. That's what the AUA says. So do the supplements first. And if after three to four months, you're not where you feel like you want to be, then you move up to, to your step two treatment options. And that might be hydroxyzine and antihistamine, a low-dose antidepressant, or, or a rescue install. Tamara asks her, is pelvic, di pelvic dysfunction and IC and lichen sclerosis connected? I have all three and it's a living nightmare. They play off each other, IC and LS or autoimmune, but I don't think pelvic is, hun. IC is not autoimmune except in a very small subtype. Remember, we're doing something called subtyping now. So we cannot make the blanket statement that IC is an autoimmune disorder because it certainly isn't for patients with pelvic floor dysfunction or pudendal neuralgia. Uh, or even in some cases like chemo-induced cystitis, autoimmunity has nothing to do with it. Um, the lichen sclerosis, though, uh, is incredibly challenging. You know, the name is distracting because you think lichen, you're thinking it must be some sort of fungal infection. But in fact, lichen sclerosis, basically what happens is the tissue turns white, you get very poor blood flow, and you have lots of nerve issued nerve, exquisite nerve sensitization. So what I'm hoping that they're doing, Tamara, is I really hope that they're giving you um, a stuff for your vulva. Um, um, she says, for those of you who don't know, lichen sclerosis is thinning skin that cracks and bleeds and fuses together. That's very extreme. Your clitoris and your, your anal area can fuse together. The pain is excruciating, cause pelvic floor issues. Um, my, you know, I, I will tell you that my mother, Tamara, has IC and lichen sclerosis. Um, it's all about tissue care. And I truly hope that they have given you an estrogen product to work on your the quality and health of your skin, as well as a mucosal barrier. Um, one product that you might find very helpful is called V Magic. Let me go get it. Let me go get it. So you have to remember that your vulva 
is a mucous membrane covered organ and it's meant to be slick. It is meant to be moist. It's when it's dry that things start sticking together. And so it is in our best interest to try to keep this tissue moist. And if you are in extreme estrogen atrophy and or if you cannot use estrogen, that gets really hard. So what do you do? This is a product that is changing many, many lives. It is called Medicine Mama's V Magic Intimate Skin Balm. And it is an organic olive oil, um, avocado oil, sea buckthorn oil, honey. And this is what I use now. So it's kind of like the consistency. It's a very, very light. Um, it's wonderful. I, it's as close as you're going to get to the normal consistency of your mucus down there. Um, and I think that this is would be a very interesting, viable option. Um, I will tell you that I have I had vulvodynia for years, um, especially in my 20s, my high school in 20s. And um, so my vulva is very, very sensitive. I have no problem tolerating this. I can use this every day and it doesn't bother me. So Tamara, this would be something else I think might be really interesting for you to try. And of course, the pain of, vulva, of vulvodynia and lichen sclerosis is certainly going to make your muscles tight. And so doing muscle relaxation would be very beneficial um, and, and potentially working with a pelvic floor physical therapist. You know, remember we have something that, uh, we have what I call the chicken versus the egg dilemma. Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? And for us, it's which comes first, the bladder or the pelvic floor, or in your case, the vulva or the pelvic floor. They're both involved because they are so incredibly interconnected. So for the bladder, your symptoms can start after a bladder wall injury or after a pelvic floor injury. So let's say you were a chemo patient and your bladder irritation started as you were going through chemotherapy. We know that the chemicals of chemo irritate the bladder wall. So here you've got a bladder wall that is irritated and the muscles supporting it will compensate for that pain in a guarding reflex by getting tight. So we know for these patients, if we can calm and soothe the bladder, those muscles will relax, okay? But consider the opposite circumstance. What about those patients whose symptoms began after falling or having a baby? For them, so here's your bladder, here's your pelvic floor. For them, their muscles were traumatized. And because their muscles were hurt, they got weak. And because they're weak and they can't do their job, they got tight. They got tight. And so here they've got super tight muscles compressing blood flow for a normal bladder and a normal vulva and a normal vulva. Now for these patients, Many of them don't know that they have a problem until they have bladder symptoms. They got frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. And of course, what do you assume when you've got frequency, urgency, pressure, pain? You assume you've got infection. So you call the doctor, you say, I've got an infection. The doctor goes, you probably do. And they give you antibiotics over the phone and they don't work. You call the doctor back. The doctor has you go in. You have a urine culture. It's negative. But the doctor goes, oh, maybe you've got infection anyway. And they put you on antibiotics anyway. They don't work. Then you go back to the doctor. The doctor says, well, maybe you've got overactive bladder and they put you on OAB meds. They don't work. Then finally, you go back to the doctor weeks or months later and the doctor goes, oh, maybe you've got IC and they give you Elmeron or Instils and they don't work. Why don't they work? Because none of them are dealing with the fundamental problem here, which is freaking tight muscles that have been hurt. So for these people, our therapeutic priority it's not to treat the bladder. Our therapeutic priority is to get the muscles to relax, to improve blood flow to the bladder so that the bladder gets the nutrients that it needs to heal. And that same thing applies to the vulva. If you've got tight muscles, they're restricting blood flow to the vulva also. So that would be the other thing that Tamara, I think you really need to explore is what is going on with your muscles if anything. 
Okay. So remember, 20 years ago, we all thought IC was an incurable bladder disease. And then in 2008, the National Institutes of Health released their first pelvic floor physical therapy study with IC patients. And the data was stunning that pelvic floor physical therapy outperformed pretty much every other IC treatment and helped many, many patients. And it was that that moment in 2008 that the entire IC world had to go, uh-oh. Now, if this were a bladder disease, muscle therapy shouldn't work. So maybe it's not a bladder disease. Maybe for some people, it's a muscle problem. And that was the genesis for what we now know are the subtypes. Hunter's lesions, bladder injury, muscle injury, pudendal neuralgia, and central sensitization. So again, Tamara, I would really ask you to consider the possibility that you, you could have tight muscles that are preventing your vulva from being healthy because of poor blood supply. And so I think you need to explore that, okay? Lisa says she had her urine tested by Microgen. She did the next generation urine test. That test found enterococcus and yeast, but her doctor dismissed it because he said he did his own test with a different company, which showed a different bacteria, treated it with antibiotics, but not enough. Now wants to do DMSO. So, so Lisa, I guess question number one is, did they treat the yeast? You know, you have to look at the two different companies. I think Volente only does PCR testing. I think the Microgen does a PCR and then the next gen test. And so, but uh, research that yourself. But the, the real key point here is that they found you had a yeast overgrowth in your bladder. Has anybody treated it? Luane asks, how can you tell by your symptoms if you have Hunter's lesions? In my case, doctor didn't know what to look for in a cystoscopy. Uh, number one, there's bleeding. There tends to be a lot of bleeding uh, during hydrodistension. Uh, patients with Hunter's lesions have really extreme frequency, urgency, pain. You're not sleeping through the night. You're getting up 10, 15, 20 times a night. You're often down to eating five or six foods because your bladder's reacting to lots of foods. Um, ultimately, though, uh, what I would do, if your doctor doesn't know how to look for them, I think you need to get a second opinion from a doctor who does know how to look at them. Lisa says her doctor wants to do 100% DMSO. Uh, Lisa, that's not FDA approved. That would be malpractice to do 100% DMSO. Um, you know what I would do if I were you uh, is I would get the data from both of them. I would get the data from Microgen and from Volente, and I would send them back to Microgen and ask them for comment. Um, you know, there's always a chance that you've got some skin bacteria that can, fell into one sample and not the other sample. Um, but but you're you're kind of nailing the critical issue here, and that is, what do we do? when we have a doctor who won't believe those results. And Microgen have doctors on staff that will work with you. Uh, and maybe you need to work with a primary care and or maybe we need to get your urine tested a third time to figure out which test is the most accurate for you. Uh, Amy asked me to talk about the Candida Connection. Uh, it is our own National Institutes of Health who made the discovery that many patients in IC flares actually have candida in their urine. Uh, that came out, I think, four years ago. I have a blog on it on our website on the IC network. So you can go over to the IC network and actually read the research study. Just go, go over to ic-network.com, search for candida, and the blog on that should come up. It was in our magazine also. Um, and, uh, you know, why are we more prone to candida? I, I think it's simply because of any patient group out there, we're the ones who are the most exposed to antibiotics because probably every single person in this room has been on multiple antibiotics for their IC symptoms over time. And that just creates the perfect environment for 
bad bacteria to grow or, or, and also to remove the bacteria which normally keep the candida and the fungus in check. And that's why candida grows in people who are, have taken antibiotics. Maureen asks, what drinks can we have? Uh, Maureen, um, uh, you should watch the beginning of this when it's recorded. Um, I, I think that the next thing that you can try is, it, uh, so, oh, and by the way, by the way, did you guys see that celestial seasoning study, the herbal tea study that came out? And it turned out that, I know I don't, I don't want to be misquoted, but it was stunning what the contaminants were in herbal blends that was stunning to me. So we want you to do, you know, I would stay away from tea mixes. I would try to keep it simple, a plain peppermint, a plain chamomile. Uh, uh, we have uh, this rubose, which only has a little bit of pumpkin in it, a couple of other spices in it. So I think you can see this is a well-used tin. It's pretty dirty. Don't even want to show it to you. Um, and then, of course, you could try white hot chocolate. We sell this in the IC Network store. We also have, this is white hot chocolate. We also have pumpkin spice white hot chocolate. We have samples that you can buy. Um, and then watch the beginning of this second half of this meeting, and you can see our chat about other hot drinks and our coffee challenge. Whoops, hold on. Alyssa says she can't have anything carbonated because it kills your bladder. Melissa, is that true for sparkling water? Does sparkling water bother you too? Um, uh, the sparkling water usually comes from carbonic acid. And for some people, carbonic acid can be a bit, a bit more irritating. One of the ways that you can kind of get past that, I mean, I, I drink a lot of sparkling water myself, is I always have it on ice to dilute it. Uh, but I don't do any sodas or anything like that anymore. I've had one soda in, I, 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 I kid you not, I probably had one or two sodas in 20 years. And that was only a small 7-Up because I was really nauseated. So I stay away from soda, but I can get away with some of the sparkling, the plain sparkling waters. Don't do any vitamin waters, any waters with flavoring or citric acid. Stay away from all those. I used to love Clearly Canadian. And then they changed the formula and then they ended up putting citric acid in it and some sort of artificial sugar in it. So that was, that was terrible. Hey, Heidi asks, is anybody else having trouble with their insurance covering their IC meds? Uh, first Hyofen was denied, then went through about seven other versions with some help of IC friends, not covered. Um, they've taken away coverage for Vesicare. Um, uh, there's a website called drugrx.com. I would go over there because they have, um, they list the medications and they will list the, the commercial pricing for those meds as well as any coupons from the companies. Um, but that's why the supplements are so viable right now is, I mean, the reality is, is that the drug companies are a for-profit industry. They're putting all of the extra money into shareholder profits and that's why prices are going up and it's a great tragedy and we need to get the profit out of pharmaceutical and medical devices in my opinion it's a travesty what's happening and it's just greed pure and simple it's greed you got to understand that drug companies now they're they're not even funding a lot of research anymore because research is expensive so those companies that are known for creating cutting edge antibiotics, they've cut those programs because they don't want to make a medicine that people might take once every three years for a week. They want to take a, make a medicine people have to take every day. That's profit for them. And so we've got to take that motivation out of that industry and get them back to serving the greater good, which is, which is a great challenge for our government right now. JJ says, my spasms are like labor pains due to the DMSO instills. It, it has been years since I had DMSO. 
I wouldn't think that they would be continuing, hon. I, I think that, again, you have to differentiate between is it a bladder wall spasm or a pelvic floor spasm? If it's a bladder wall spasm, that means that your bladder wall is being really irritated by something. And it would be something as simple as a vitamin that you're taking every day or something else that you're taking every day, green tea, coffee, a medicine. Uh, if it's pelvic floor spasms, it means that you've got some pelvic floor issues that, that need to go on, that need to be addressed. Tamara says she's using clobetasol for her lichen sclerosis. Um, yeah, uh, that's completely normal, but they would also, oh, hun, oh, no, 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 no. The Premarin cream, that's where you got to change. That's where you've got to change. Premarin is notorious for causing extra irritation and burning. Pregnant, it comes from pregnant mare urine. It's that industry where they keep horses pregnant up in Canada, and they just collect all their pee and extract the estrogen out of their urine. And then the problem with Premarin is, is so it's so highly manufactured and because it comes from horses they have to put a lot of extra stuff in it to make it sense uh, safe for humans and premarin it has a lot of preservatives in it too and so premarin cream is notorious for causing vulvar burning i mean there have been books i have a book here on my shelf right here called screaming to be heard but um here i've got it Screaming to be heard, hormonal connections that women suspect and doctors ignore. And this was the first book that talked about Premarin and the irritation that patients have with Premarin. Um, we do better with a compounded preservative-free estrogen cream. So I get mine from the Women's International Pharmacy. Uh, it's a mail order pharmacy based in Arizona. They ship across the country and they, and they make preservative free formulas that don't burn like Premarin does. Premarin is something that any patient with vulvodynia, it should really be off of the table because it has such a strong history of chemical irritation. So Tamara, that would be one thing that I would really look at. Pamela says she's starting Sister Protect for a day. How long will it take? Um, you know, I would expect at least a couple of weeks, three to four weeks, um, up to three, up to three to four months. But follow the diet too, and let's see how you do. Heidi said Sister Project never worked. Went to Pro said and did great. Um, and so Heidi, again, that's really a, that helps us understand the mechanism of action of your specific bladder dysfunction. So your issue isn't necessarily with a coating. Your issue is probably more with muscle, maybe bladder wall muscle. Tamara says she has 10 weeks of pelvic floor therapy. It went completely away. Awesome. Girl, seriously, you just completely reinforced what I said. So 10 weeks of pelvic floor physical therapy, your symptoms went away, then you had a flare-up, then your muscles got tight again in a guarding reflex, and so now you're in that tight pelvic floor flare again, and you're right. Now you have to, the way you get back to remission is by doing the pelvic floor work again, not just the exercises. Get on into that physical therapist and have them look and see if there's anything else going on with your muscles. Becky has a very good question. Becky says, have you ever heard of anyone's feet being restless or ticklish when their bladder fills? I've been flaring with urgency, frequency, and bladder spasm that makes my feet so uncomfortable that I can't keep them still at night. You're wondering if there's a neurological issue. You know, hun, I have the same thing 
oh, uh, the bottom of my feet tingle. They was doing it two days ago like mad. Um, and for me, it's associated with a bowel movement that, you know, you have to remember that you've got, you know, here's your pelvic floor and there's your hole, you know, so your pelvic floor. And then it's got basically two holes down here for your, for your urethra and your bladder and your nerve. There are a lot of nerves that kind of go through here. Right. And, and as it, so the nerves, actually I have the wrong way. You got, I have a picture actually. Let me, let me show you this picture because really what that is, is something is pushing on a nerve that is then going down your leg. And for me, it's usually a, a slightly firmish bowel movement. And once it gets past that and isn't pushing on that nerve, it goes away. That's how I know. That started happening in, the, in my 20s. I thought it was crazy. It's like, why are my feet tingling like this? And then 10 minutes later, I'd go and have a poop and it stopped. And it's like, oh, 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 makes sense. All right. So here. Let's look at this picture here for a moment. So this is a picture of, oh, hold on, all the nerves in the pelvis. And when they go up, they all coalesce in one point in the lower spine, right? Well, what this doesn't show is that some nerves come from the spine and then they split and they go down the leg. And that's why the post-tibial nerve, remember I, I talked early, earlier about neuromodulation and how I have this tattoo right here so what they did is they stimulated this, this, the nerve at this point, and that stimulation went up my leg into my bladder and helped stop that flare. So I think what's happening is I think that, that you're probably dealing with what I was dealing with, what I deal with frequently, and that is whether it's genetic or hereditary, you and I have a nerve that is coming very close to our, our bowel, and whenever something goes through it, it pushes on that nerve, which then triggers that that weird feeling in the bottom of our feet. That's my guess, hon. And maybe for you, you've got a nerve that is being compromised when you're having a spasm that is also reflecting down your leg. Interesting, isn't it? I I, I really honestly thought I was a you know, that was in my 20s when all sorts of really weird things were happening. And I distinctly remember being on the couch reading and feeling my the bottom of my feet, you know, tingling. And it's it scared me until we finally figured it out. It's just like, no, it's just a nerve that's just right next to your bowel. And if you're if you know, it, it just tells me I need to have a bowel movement. That's all. And it's a guarantee. 10 minutes, 15 minutes later, it's going to happen. I have no shame. I'll talk about anything. I know, right? You think you're going crazy. It's like, what the hell is this? It's so weird. Um, but it all makes sense anatomically. Julie asked on YouTube, because you guys were simulcasting on Facebook and YouTube, she says, uh, is bottled water the best option? Uh, yeah, bottled water, well, spring water. Spring water is the best option. Hello, Tomas from Brazil. Hello, I don't know if you have, this is an interstitial cystitis support group meeting, so I'm hoping that you're here. Well, I, I, I don't hope that you have IC, but I hope that you've come here because you're looking for help with IC. If you are, if you have frequency, urgency, pressure, pain, you are in the right place. Well, I think I got most of your questions here. 
Last call, last call, last call for questions, my friends. Last call for questions. If you find these meetings helpful, we really, 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 really need you to become a member of the IC Network where you can get this incredibly good magazine, the IC Optimist. It is your memberships which make these meetings happen, and you can do it for as little as $25 a year and get the best patient magazine in the country. Um, and our fall magazine uh, is it should be out next week, and I'm really excited about it because we have an incredible interview, a very long interview with the author of this book. And so please come on over to our website, the IC Network, and become a member. Um, you have to go over to our shop to do it. We also have a free newsletter, but that's not a membership. Our, our magazines have information that we do not release publicly for about six months because I got to give my members something to give them a reason to help the cause. Right? Pamela, uh, can you, um, she asked, can you repeat what you did for the restless feet? Uh, my feet weren't restless. It wasn't restless leg. It was tingling. It was tingling for me and it was tickling and tingling. And uh, ultimately it was about uh, getting my, my bowel movements at that time were very hard and firm and I had to get things a little softer so they wouldn't push on nerves to cause it. Uh, this is not restless leg syndrome. It's more this weird foot tingling. Mary Jo asks, um, she goes to her ophthalmologist every year. So you go in February again. Do you think I should go now or wait? Mary Jo, if you're having any eye symptoms at all, I would go now. Um, I would, I would definitely, I would definitely go now. I will tell you that our data, our study um, of over 700 patients is showing a pretty high incidence of eye issues, 53% the last time I looked. We have a citizen position, petition now with the FDA that I have filed. Uh, we got over 800 patients to participate in the Emory study uh, last week. And so we've got we've got important information coming out. But in the meantime, just be on top of any eye symptoms. Uh, Julie asked for any filters. Uh, no. Um, uh, 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 Janet. Uh, from Winnipeg is asking about buscapan as a smooth muscle relaxant. And do you know if it's effective uh, for bladder muscle spasms? I think it is, um, but it's not. Um, let me look it up, but hopefully I won't crash this computer. So it's used to treat crampy pain, esophageal spasms, renal colic, and bladder spasms. Um, I would try it and see how you do. Why not? Try a small amount, see if it's helpful. Uh, I used to take Levson for, I used to have a lot of uh, esophageal spasms and, and back when the IBS was starting and we didn't figure, you know, and I had gastroparesis. Um, uh, so having that now is, is really, really helpful. All right, my friends, it is three o'clock in California. I have a Christmas tree to put up, so I'm going to end this now. However, I do want to just remind you, I always end my meetings with a very, very important message, even doubly important now for the holiday season. There is no shame. There is no blame because you have IC. I don't want you carrying any guilt. I don't want you carrying uh, any baggage of thinking that you're damaged goods or that you've done something wrong or this is your fault or anything like that. It's amazing how that happens, especially, and it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, it happens. Um, you are no different than someone who is hit by a car. Now, you know, if you had somebody in your family who was hit by a car, you would not only take them to the hospital, you would 
bring them home. You would nurse them in their bed. You would change the TV channel for them. You would do everything you could for them while they were healing. I want to remind you that you deserve exactly that same care. If you are struggling, please ask your family for help. If they do not understand IC, if they are disrespecting you, if they are laughing at you and telling you that it's all in your head, I have an answer for that. My answer for that is power. Information is power, my friends. This is what I want you to do. I want you to go to this website, the American Neurology Association website, auanet.org. In the upper right hand corner is a link that says guidelines. I want you to go click on guidelines. Then I want you to search for the interstitial cystitis guidelines. And then I want you to print it out. It's going to be 60 pages, 60 power punt, power, not punt, power filled patient pages that will give you cutting edge information to take apart any argument they give you that this is not real because this is real. And this is one of the best documents you'll find. And one of the reasons why this document is so good is that it is very compassionate about pain care. They support pain care. They want pain assessed at every appointment. They support the use of opiate medication if necessary. So if you're struggling with pain and somebody's blowing you off, this document will help you with that. Print three copies, one for you, one for your doctor, and one to carry with you if you ever have to go to the emergency room because it is a powerful educational tool if you ever encounter anybody who doesn't know what IC is, okay? So auanet.org, upper right-hand corner, click on guidelines, search for interstitial cystitis, print out three copies of it, and that is a critical weapon that will help you defeat anybody messing with you. All right, my friends. I'm going to take that off. Woo! It's all about lighting management when you do this. I'm going to wish you well. Have a lovely day. Have a lovely holiday season. I'm going to do these once a week during the holidays because I know many of you really need support. And so our next scheduled meeting is in two, week, two weeks from today, but you're going to find a meeting next week on a Wednesday. Uh, the time and place, uh, the time may change depending upon uh, my schedule that day. All righty. If you have any questions, you know who to call. Please feel free to come to our website. Call our patient support phone line. If you need help, 1-800-928-7496. Believe it or not, I answer the phone for the patient support line. However, if you get the service, just please leave a message because we can only work with one or two patients at a time. I will call you back when I can, usually usually within 24 hours, but sometimes within five minutes. So please be patient. Things happen. I do my best. All right, everybody. Happy holidays. See you later. Hello, YouTube. Facebook has gone. And you are also uh, wished a very wonderful holiday season. I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.